the past few times I've been up here, <clears throat> I know exactly which direction I wanted to go. Um, Holy Spirit had laid it on my heart <clears throat> well in advance. Um, I knew that we were going to be speaking on relationships, uh, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, but I, I didn't know where I needed to go. I know that <clears throat> Lindy was going to be speaking on friendship. Uh, I was going to speak on um, our relationship with God. And you can go so many different directions with our relationship with God. Uh, I thought that I knew uh, midweek, talked to Jonas about it, talked to Lindy about it, and I, I really never felt um, sold on what I had decided. I didn't get any, <clears throat> I didn't get confirmation on where I wanted to go with this until yesterday morning. Uh, so everything that I had done up to that point, yeah, there was some of it that's applicable to what I'm going to be speaking on this morning, but uh, my complete outline of what I was going to speak on completely changed yesterday morning. I, I spoke with Dad yesterday. He's, he's my spiritual leader, so if I've got something I want to bounce off of him, that's where I'm going. Um, and uh, there's a certain point in my message that I, I really struggled with because God kept, or the Holy Spirit kept leading me back to a scripture in the Old Testament that I really didn't want to touch on. And so I, that's what the main reason I called him. And, and I didn't even know if I was going to use it or not. And I, I just kept in tune with the Holy Spirit in prayer all morning. And finally, um, I got an answer on that particular part. And it just amazes me every time that, you know, we can read as much as we want and we can study as much as we want. But until the Holy Spirit lays that exact word on your heart, you just don't know what you want to do. And so, <clears throat> first of all, I just want to give glory to him this morning because he comes through every time. It doesn't matter uh, what it is, he's going to come through. I also want to give thanks. I usually uh, am last minute on uh, handing my scriptures in. <clears throat> Sorry, Joel. Uh, it's usually morning of. Um, and then uh, I even sent a couple of additions after I had sent the scriptures to him. But we couldn't do it without that great team we've got back there in that sound booth. So relationships. You know, Lindy spoke on, on friendship last week, and it was amazing. Um, hit on uh, several key points. Um, I want to pull up one of them that hit home with me. Um, I've got her notes. She's more technologically advanced than I am. I write everything down. I'm still old school. Um, one of them, and I think it was number like point three or four, but it's accountability. Friends hold us accountable. Um, and uh, when I get to it, I'll, I'll mention it. Uh, <clears throat> but David had one key person in his life that was Nathan, and and I'll allude to him when I get there. But it really he he held David accountable for his actions. Um, getting this going. Um, relationships really stem from our heart. They start right here. And there's one person in the Bible, and it mentions it twice, um, and it's David, that he had a heart after God. That's something I've strived for my whole life. Really didn't fully understand what it was. But I, you know, I've always wanted God to think of me like, like I have a heart after him. Um, Acts really just explains it really clearly when and Paul, and Paul writes this. So that the meaning of having a heart after God, I'm going to read this whole scripture. It's Acts 13 and 22. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And here's the key point. He will do everything that I want him to do. Let that sink in for a minute. David will do everything I want him to do. Now, David obviously had some serious character flaws. But I can guarantee you that so do every one of you, as well as me, in this room, have some serious character flaws. But God sees right through every one of those character flaws and sees your heart. And are you willing to do what He asks of you? <clears throat> so, 
So to live in close relation with God, we need a heart that's completely sold out for him, meaning that we're going to do anything that he asks. And in order to do this, we must exhibit God's character. If you Google God's character, you're going to get a whole slew of things thrown back at you. So I could talk on and on and on and on and on about God's character because there's so many wonderful aspects to his character. But I'm going to hit on five of them this morning. Um, Those five that I'm going to hit on, David exhibited those character traits, but there's also someone in the New Testament that exhibited all five, and that would be Jesus. Okay, he exhibited, you know, Jesus was truly God, or fully God and fully man, so he he exhibited all those good character traits that, that David had as well. And if you really dive into David's life and Jesus' life, they, one, they were related, uh, that Jesus came from the same lineage that David was from, and also there are a lot of things mirror each other in their lives. So first, <clears throat> we have to have faith in God. David understood this concept at a very young age. If you'll pop up 1 Samuel 17, 36 and 37 for me. Let us find a good musician to play the harp whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you. Nope, that's 1 Samuel 16. I need 17, 36, and 37. Sorry, Joel. Hmm? Yep. 1 Samuel 17, verse 36 and 37. I can read it. Can you guys read that? I can read that. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do this to this pagan Philistine. Two, for he has defiled the army of God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Wow. Wow. So if you've ever read that, I'm sure most of us are familiar with the story of David and Goliath. Um, He was this massive nine-foot man um, that he was kind of the the leader of that army. Um, So for a shepherd boy to have that kind of faith in God really truly amazes me. So God had delivered David from his enemies from a very young age. So he, he slew a bear. He slew a lion as a boy. Okay, think of a little guy, you know, going up against a bear or a lion and having the faith that he, that God gave him. And he, he didn't matter what it was, what enemy that Satan threw at David. He knew that God would pull him through. So how many of us have faced giants in our lives? Or how many of us are facing giants right now? Do you have the faith that God will bring you through to the other side of that situation. David fully knew that he could slay that giant. Jesus also exhibited a strong faith in God throughout his life. So he had, Jesus had to have a very close connection with the Father. So if you'll go to Philippians 2, 1 through 8, and I'm going to read an excerpt here from an article I found. Actually, Joel, I think it's Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. That's where I need. Sorry. Okay. So Hebrews 12 implicitly but very clearly asserts that Jesus is a model of faith for us. And note that it comes, and at the end of this list, heroes of faith, Jesus is at the capstone of this list. So therefore, since we have surrounded, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, 
Jesus, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So it all starts with him, who for the sake of joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. He is the pioneer, the trailblazer, whom we are to follow the path of faith. Before and while it was occurring, Jesus' crucifixion seemed like a gigantic, horrible, humiliating, embarrassing, painful loss to Jesus. The loss of his life, his ministry, his privacy, his dignity, his family, his friends, and all of his hopes seemed to be hanging there. But he trusted in God and through it all, never cursing his fate, his God or his enemies, but expecting God's complete vindication, which at the time was nowhere in sight. Mark 35 and 34 says that he prayed Psalm 22 from the cross. He must have focused on what he had read before from God, that he would be raised and exalted on the third day. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. If those are not words of faith, I don't know what is. In order to say those words, Jesus demonstrated a faith unlike any other because he knew the Father would follow through with that plan to save humanity. Trust. That's our second point. You might say faith and trust are alike. Yes, they do are alike, but they're two totally different things. Faith is a substance of hope, and trust is built over time. David understood this, and... Through adversity in our life, we have to have trust in our Father. For any of you that are married or in covenant relationship, you know that trust is, for, is, is vital for relational survival. It's a must. I'm going to read one more excerpt to you guys. This is from a different, this is from a book that I love. As a man of covenant, David had received progressively more kingdom authority and power. He had reached the goal prophesied by Samuel years before. However, the path to this place in David's life had been marked by many battles. What David revealed in his life was that even though God makes a covenant promise, we still have to engage in kingdom warfare to possess the promise. God had promised the land of Israel to Abraham, and although Joshua and Caleb had led and fought well at the end of their lives, the job remained incomplete. It needed David's total determination to secure final possession of what had been promised. David knew that that promise had not been fulfilled just yet, and through that adversity, he, con he continued to push through until it got finished. Jesus revealed similar determination as he brought healing, deliverance, justice for the oppressed, and mercy for the abused. If we are to follow Jesus, we have to fight for these things. The New Testament makes it very clear that the kind of physical battles that David engaged foreshadowed the spiritual battles that are ours. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our battle is not with human beings, but with the agents of evil, and this enemy is the one against which we must equip ourselves, equip ourselves to fight and defeat. As we come to Scripture with a New Testament understanding, we can see that Scripture does not support or endorse holy wars, genocides, ethnic cleansing, and torture-ridden regimes that we have seen down through the centuries and so sadly are all too present in our contemporary world. We must instead use the biblical history of armed conflict as a graphic illustration of how we should fight for what is right and what is good. The struggle is nonetheless real for us, but is a spiritual battle rather than a physical one. That doesn't mean that our battles or what God promises is just handed to us, okay? We will face adversity, and we must have complete trust. Like I said, trust is built. 
I'm sure all of us have had something that the, the Holy Spirit or God has given to us and He's came through for us. Remember those times and allow that trust to continue to be built in your life. The third point I want to hit on is God expects us, regardless of our successes, to show complete humility. 1 Samuel 16, 16 through 18. If anybody had a right to be full of pride and boast, it was David. Let us find a good musician to play the harp whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you. He will play soothing music, and you will soon be well again. All right, Saul said, find me someone who plays well and bring him here. One of the servants said to Saul, one of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is a talented harp player. Not only that, he's a brave warrior, a man of war, has good judgment, and he is also a fine-looking young man, and the Lord is with him. Keep that up there for me. Look at all of those attributes. If you start diving into David's life, dude was a stud. He was an amazing warrior, um, had great physical prowess, was fast, uh, could leap and run like a deer, was good looking, could play like he was a rock star with a harp. I mean, probably could give him a, an electric guitar, he probably could have ripped it in two. And then the Lord was with him. So he had all of these things going for him. Yet throughout his entire life, through all of his successes, all of his wins in battle and in war and everything that God had given him, he showed complete humility. He knew that everything in his life had been given to him by his Holy Father. And you can go back to his beginnings when he was a poor shepherd even. Watching over some sheep was the youngest of his brothers, so I'm sure he got picked on throughout his entire childhood. But yet God raised him up to be king over all of Israel. And still, he showed humility. All right. So Jesus, from the beginnings of his life, showed us that what true humility looks like. There had never been before and never will be again someone so superior in every way. Everything that he did from the time of, a, of being a child, he knew the scriptures at the age of 12 and was reciting them to in the synagogues. Like He knew the entire Bible at the age of 12, basically. So <clears throat> I learned this from Adam. They were a, an oral culture back then. Like we, have, we have books everywhere. We read on our phones, read books. They didn't have that. So they actually memorized the Word of God. And by the age of 12, he was able to recite all of it. He lived with no fault. He lived with no shame or weakness of any kind. Yet his humility surpassed everyone that has ever been or will ever be. Philippians 2, 1 through 8. Paul summed this up in one brief scripture. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with one, with one or with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ did. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. 
when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. The most humbling experience that has ever been done to anyone. Death on a cross was humiliating. A lot of them were stripped naked and hung up there for everyone to see. And he endured every single bit of that for you. The next point I'm going to hit on is being uh, fully in tune or being aware of what God's will is in your life. And that you have human will, but God's will needs to surpass that in your life. I'm going to preface this. So, we all know in Romans 6.23, maybe not all of us, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, in the Old Testament, it's completely new or completely different from the New Testament. Okay? So, typically in the Old Testament... um, the blood, typically of a lamb, was slain to cover sin. Um, We know that through Jesus, um, only blood will cover and atone for our sins. And I don't know if I've ever read, Dad, maybe you can help me out here, of a single time with the exception of one where um, someone died to cover someone else's sin, other than the aspect of the point I'm going to hit. I don't know of another one. And so it mirrors Jesus' life very, very closely. David, some of those character flaws that he had, lust, um, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. Um, He got her pregnant. And in order to cover that sin up, sent her husband, who was a a warrior, sent him to the front of the battle lines to make sure that he died. So in order to, well, he sinned, but in order to, he had to make a cover-up to get rid of it. So, and he got really deep into that sin and, and actually was blinded by it until, here's my point about Nathan. Nathan came to David and told him a parable. And it made David extremely mad, and he said, we should kill that person. And Nathan said, well, that person is you. You have done these things. You have taken and stolen things that weren't yours. You stole a man's wife and then killed him to keep her. So I hit on the wages of sin is death. All right, pop up 2 Samuel 12, 13 and 14. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you and you won't die for this sin. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord, by doing this, your child will die. Will you put up 16 for me? David begged God to spare the child. He went without food and lay all night on the bare ground. This completely ties in to what our, our Holy Father, Jesus, went through. Jesus, or David, has sinned. Blood had to atone for that sin. And this is the only time where in the Old Testament I know of that a lamb was not used, but a person. Not only were they related, they went through some of the same things. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus understood God's will. And just like David prayed and pleaded with God and was full of sorrow for a son, Jesus pleaded and was full of sorrow to his father for the son. He knew what he was going up against. But his complete humanity was on full display for us in that garden. Will you pop that up there for me? Matthew 26. 36 through 39. 
I've covered this scripture before from up here. And I think the reason I love it so much is we think of Jesus as this, this person that's up here. And yes, he is. But not only was he God, he was, he was man, just like all of us in here. Okay, he, sh- he had those humanity traits. Then Jesus went with him to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, sit here while I go over here to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. I can guarantee you that's what David felt, the same type of anguish and sorrow. Stay here and watch with me. He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken from me. Let Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. You have to understand that even in the tough parts of your life, when your will is pointing you somewhere, make sure you align it with God's. Get in the Word. Everything that you need stems from the Word of God. One more thing. All relationships require meaningful time spent. They will not grow without it. So unless you are spending time with the Father, your relationship will become stagnant and falter. David and Jesus both lived this out. The book of Psalms gives us many examples of how much David understood that spending time with God was the primary way to grow his relationship with him. Psalm 5 and 3. Listen to my voice in the morning, Lord. Each morning, I bring my request to you and wait expectantly. Psalm 6, 63 and 1. Is that 60? Did I send you the wrong one, Joel? That one's good too. Oh God, listen to my cry. Hear my prayer. Psalm 119, 147 and 148. I rise early before the sun is up. I cry out for help and put my hope in your words. I stay awake through the night thinking about your promise. These few examples, the Psalms is full of David's relationship with God. He expressed it. He wrote almost like, I think he wrote about half the book of Psalms with things that he experienced with God. So these highlight that David made it a point to spend time with God each and every day. And not just spent time, he enjoyed the time that he spent with God. Scripture lists lists multiple times that Jesus also spent meaningful time with the Father. Mark 1 and 35. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Just leave that one up there. How many times have you gotten up well before daylight just to go spend time with Jesus? Think about it. This is, and the word tells us he often did this. He often withdrew to lonely places. And I'm not sure if that's one of the scriptures I'm going to hit on, but I bet it is. If you aren't praying routinely, if you aren't praying routinely, you will not grow your relationship with Him. He desires so much just to talk to you on a daily basis. Jesus understood this, wholeheartedly understood that his communion with the Father was the only reason that he lived a shame-free, sin-free, perfect life to offer up a sacrifice. He, he knew that he had to stay completely in tune with Jesus, or with the Father, every single day throughout the entire day. 
Mark five or Luke five and six. But Jesus often Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. Matthew fourteen and twenty three. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. In Luke 6 and 12. One day soon after, Jesus went up on the mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. He stayed up the entire night to spend time with his father. I'll close with this. Being in close relationship with God is the most dynamic and wonderful aspect of my life. I have some amazing people in my life. My wife, my two two little girls, Brindley and Hadley, um, my mom and dad, and the rest of my family. I love them dearly, but there's nothing that compares in my life to my relationship with God. It's taken me years to understand that the relationship he desires is not one of just loving him. Yes, he desires that, but having a heart that's willing to do whatever he asks. And I'm not there yet. I may never get there, but every single day, that's what I'm striving for. That yes, God, I'll do it. Yes, God, I'll do it. Yes, God, I'll do it. Yes, God, I'll do that too. Both David and Jesus lived this out by sharing their faith and trust in all circumstances. They humbly sought God's guidance. They adhered to his will and spent much of their time in meaningful communion with him to ensure relational growth. Let's pray. Holy Father, I hope these words that you've given me have resonated in the hearts and minds of each and every single person here that they're able to re- <clears throat> to grow their relation with you. And they put that relationship first in everything that they do. That when they rise, your name is on their lips from the get-go. And it's on their lips when they lay their head down at night to go to sleep. Relationship with you, Father, is not just about loving you. It's about doing what you ask. Father, give us the ability and the will to say yes to you in whatever you ask us to do. In your name I pray, amen.